Welcome everybody to Circle of Fellows. This is the episode for uh, April 2023. I'm Shel Holtz. I am a fellow. I, I am Senior Director of Communications at WebCore, which is a commercial builder uh, and general contractor uh, in San Francisco, and uh, thrilled to be here with today's panel to talk about crisis communication, uh, all dimensions of that. Uh, and before we jump into our questions, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Carolyn, let's start with you. Thanks, Jill. Hi, everyone. Very nice to be here today. I'm Caroline Sapriel. Um, I'm a fellow, and I've my, I'm the founder and managing partner of CSNA International. We are a global firm specializing in risk, crisis, and business continuity management for 30 years. Nice to be here. Thank you. Great to have you here, Carolyn, all the way from Lisbon. And uh, John, you're up next. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm John Clemens. Um, I have been a uh, communication professional for over 30 years. I've been in IABC almost all of those 30 years. Um, I have my own consultancy, and I am also an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and Loyola University in New Orleans. Great to have you with us, John. Thank you. Alice, your turn. Alice, I'm, so <laughs> I'm Alice. I'm so <laughs> glad to be here. And uh, I'm a communications consultant. That seems to be the theme today with a focus on the energy industry and dealing with um, energy and environmental responsibility issues. No crises ever come up in that <laughs> At all. industry, right? No. No. <laughs> And George. Hey, hello, everybody. I'm George McGrath. I'm based in New York, where I'm a public relations consultant. Uh, like everybody on this call, a long-term, very proud member of IABC and delighted to be here with you all today. I've done a lot of work with companies across industries over the years on crisis preparedness and crisis communications training for senior executives in a range of industries, and I know we'll be touching on a lot of those topics today as well. So I look forward to the conversation. Terrific. And for those of you who are watching live, and I can see that you're out there, if you have questions, comments, observations, uh, experiences that you want to share, just use the uh, chat feature in YouTube Live, and I'll be able to see it and share it with the panel. And uh, you can become part of this conversation. In fact, these conversations always get more interesting when we engage directly with listeners, uh, viewers. So please do. Uh, but let's start with uh, the most basic, the most fundamental question. Uh, how do you define what is a crisis? And, and I ask because in my experience, a lot of companies seem to think uh, crisis and emergency are the same thing. And yeah, personally, I disagree, but I'd love to get your take on it. So what makes a crisis a crisis? Carolyn, think... why don't we start with you? <laughs> All right. It's funny because I, I was just teaching a class at Antwerp University this morning, and I was talking exactly about this. And I totally agree. There's a lot of confusion between an emergency and a crisis. And one of the things that I use as a criteria for a crisis is lack of control. You can fix the emergency, but you can still have a, a crisis because you no longer have control. You have control only on the way you choose to deal with it. Uh, the crisis can carry on, the emergency can carry on and turn into a crisis because stakeholders drive the agenda. Um, and um, even if the actual emergency is technically over. I, I like to build on what Caroline said. I, I view it as kind of a, a major change that can negatively impact an organization, um, the organizations or the businesses, products and services, its customers, its all of its publics, as well as another topic we may cover on this call, re reputation. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's all about a situation that escalates beyond an emergency to something that could have a material effect on the company, on its on its reputation, on its uh, finances, on its viability going forward. And uh, there's no shortage of them these days. 
<laughs> some some are uh, things that are created by activities inside the company, but sometimes it's things happening outside the company that can create a crisis for you. Emergencies turn into crises, uh, yeah. don't they? I mean, I'm thinking of the train derailment in uh, East Palestine, uh, where it was an emergency because the train derailed and there was a toxic spill and a fire. But if it had been handled well, would it have necessarily elevated to that existential sort of crisis that it became? And, and I don't think so, Shell. I, I view an emergency as something contained that you can control, but a crisis is uncontrollable in the beginning. And then you have to have us step in to bring some san sanity to the situation. But it's not just us, it's, it's a collective, it's a team, mm -hmm. the leadership team, the president, the, the legal people, the HR people, it's, it's a team. But um, I, I think um, an emergency is something usually that can be controlled. Yeah. We have, we, by the way, we have a comment from uh, Anthony Falvo. Uh, an emergency is just that, an emergent issue. A crisis is a sustaining issue that could have been addressed using issues management if recognized early mm -hmm. enough. Uh, you want to riff on that a little? I think that's too limiting, frankly. I think a crisis can come from an issue or from an event or from an incident. It can be a revelation, an allegation. It could be a set of circumstances. It doesn't have to be an issue. It becomes an issue when it lingers. I, going back to the point earlier, I think there's two criteria that I that we use uh, to define, you know, uh, if a crisis is well handled or not. Is one is the level of attribution of responsibility of the organization involved, and the second is how did they handle it. You could have a very high level of attribution of responsibility, but if they handle it well, um, then it's okay. Uh, but you can also have very high level of attribution plus badly handled. So then you end up with the mega crises that are last for months and sometimes you don't recover from that. And, yeah, and I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, George. Oh, I, I think oh, it was I'm me. Just, oh, that was Alice. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was just gonna say that, um, that what Carolyn said about the self-responsibility uh, is, you know, I, an external an external emergency handled badly becomes an internal crisis mm -hmm. an yes. internal emergency is probably by its nature a crisis mm -hmm. if you if you if you did it yourself you cr if you created the emergency yourself you're in a crisis and i, I want to go back to something anthony sent his his question is not on the screen again but he says something about if detected early enough Yes, if recognized early enough, and that goes to effective crisis management, where even in the beginning, you should be doing a risk audit or assessment of your organization to see if there are some potential problems that need to be resolved before they become a crisis. And that means planning and leadership training, et cetera. But it's really important to look at what are the risks involved in your business early on. So I think Anthony made a really good point there. There's, an, uh, there's a, a, a system that, that the energy, a lot of the energy companies use um, for analyzing risk. Uh, it's called, there are a lot of risk management things, but this one's called the Swiss cheese uh, model. And it's that, okay, here is the potential uh, incident. And on either side of those things are slices of Swiss cheese. And your goal is to make sure each one of those is a layer of protection. It might be a, a policy. It might be a physical barrier. It might be uh, some kind of uh, uh, safety uh, <coughs> protocols. Mm -hmm. But... Each one of those is a layer of protection. And you typically don't have an incident without several of those layers mm -hmm. of protection lining, uh, failing together. And mm -hmm. so it's like the holes of the Swiss cheese. If they all line up, you're in trouble. And on one side is the before the incident and the other side is the after the incident. You know, how do you handle once something goes wrong? What are the things in place to fix it? And I think that we... We use this a lot when talking about physical incidents, um, like 
uh, uh, oil blowouts or, or pressure releases or things like that in the energy industry. But I think that we could use it a lot more when we talk mm -hmm. about potential crises that are financial or reputational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing about a crisis situation is it also tends to reveal the existing deep-seated problems or disconnects inside an organization. Uh, not only so, it's not only about your handling of the current crisis, but there's going to be a lot of digging by the news media and others into what's going on. And what you'll see in a lot of situations is they'll let's say it's a uh, a product contamination situation. They'll go back and they may go back and say, hey, there's other incident, incidents that the company had over the years that were just not as visible on this. That kind of shows this was something that was building for a while. Mm -hmm. So the, I think the other th thing, truism, I think about crisis situations is that anything you don't want to be revealed or don't want people to know about your company or how you operate is going to become known. Of course. Because you, you can get that level of scrutiny. And it's a level of scrutiny that probably most companies and most IBC members are not used to. I think if you work in a, a large, if you work for a large uh, multinational corporation, a big consumer products group or an energy company or a lot of these other leading businesses, you're always in that spotlight. You've got that experience. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of businesses and organizations, this, the visibility you get in a crisis may be the first and biggest time your organization becomes known to people. And so mm -hmm. the stakes for you are a lot bigger. You can, you're going to be, your organization will be defined for a long time by how you handle that crisis situation. And I think it's a particular issue for like mid-sized or smaller organizations that just don't have the exposure to this kind of stuff on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say also that, you know, if, if we recognize that according to the latest data, 50% of crises are smoldering and 50% is sudden, that means 50% of the crisis could be at least detected and mitigated, if not completely prevented. Exactly. There goes back to the point made by Anthony in his questions. Risk and issues management are absolutely key. Um, if you want to reduce the likelihood, the problem is that it's abstract. It hasn't happened. And very often, risk management systems, um, which are called ERM very often, are way too complicated for most of the organization to understand. It becomes a financial instrument as opposed to something that is tangible for people who are operating at different levels to understand and, and build a culture that, hey, I better report this prudent overreaction, which, by the way, comes out of the oil and gas industry because it was coined by Shell. Um, it makes sense. You better be safe rather than sorry. So you right. escalate, you notify, you take action before it blows up in your face. There's not always the appetite for that. You kind of have a lot of people saying, well, we managed, you know, it's, it's really funny. And I, want, I just want to say one more thing here is during COVID, people asked me, do you think there's going to be better preparedness after COVID? And I said, not necessarily. After every major crisis, there's a peak. Those that were always prepared and took it very seriously and invested will be even more prepared. The ones in the middle will continue to manage, do a bit here and there. And the ones who didn't do anything will go, thank God. And guess what? We saved a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in the end, silence equals apathy or guilt. Which area do, do you want your organization to fall into? I dare say neither. But if you just sit there and do nothing, most of the time, it won't just blow over. It will just explode. Yes. Well, how, how important is organizational culture to the ability to address a crisis? There's a crisis consultant named Melissa Agnes, and she has a book out called Crisis Ready, uh, which I have read. It's quite good. But it's all about building a crisis ready culture where people are first of all, open to the idea that there are things that we have to do in a crisis that may be counterintuitive to how we think we should behave in order to protect the organization or protect mm -hmm. revenues or what have you. So how, how important is culture and, and what do you need to do to shape it so that the leadership and, and others involved uh, are, are ready when a crisis erupts? Well, if anybody says it's not important, they're wrong. <laughs> 
Well, uh, uh, for a lot of organizations, I think there's a certain amount of hubris where they just think this is not going to happen to me. I can get by and I'll be fine. But that is not the case. You know, they and, and to your point, Shell, to build that culture as communicators, we need to talk about situations and talk about how important safety. Is. I've been in a situation where I had to do that. And we did webinars on safety that went global, that we had to talk to all of the employees about it. But you ingrain that in the messages that you share about the organization, which becomes part of the culture. And when you do the risk assessment, if it's just you and it's a small organization, you start from the top and work your way down. You talk to groups of employees. How does this operation work? Where where are the, the potential problems? And you get all of that input. That's, again, if you don't have a consultant on hand, but you can do it if you take your time and talk to um, a gr groups of employees in different levels, diverse groups of employees. It can help you. I, I, I was also going to say that, you know, the, the Chinese call a character for, for crises is, is risk and opportunity. And I think we have to shift the mindset. Crises will happen. They happen mm -hmm. in our lives on a personal basis. They happen to organizations. There are cycles. Crises will happen. So if you have the mindset that crises are on some level inevitable, but obviously you need to be prepared to mitigate, then you take that mindset and, and you, you build that culture. We, in my organization, we say risk management is a pull-up phenomenon. You have to show and tell people at a low level in the organization that if they see something that they don't like, or smell, they need to report it. It is not be, and they won't get, you know, demoted or they won't get that promotion. No, they should just report. They should be rewarded. And a crisis management is a push down phenomenon. So if on the one hand you lift that awareness for the risks and you promote that, and at the same time you have the safety net of a proper crisis management system that you push down, this is the way it happens and this is how it's going to be, um, including setting KPIs for people who are involved in crisis management. My entire organism, my entire career, I've only seen one company that had crisis KPIs. And I've only seen one organization that had really crisis audits, run internally every year and externally by assessors every other year. Mm -hmm. One of each. And that's because it's a nice to have. It's not mandated. Safety systems are imposed. They're regulated. Nobody regulates crisis readiness. Yes. For the most uh, part. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I just briefly, I, I think these crisis situations are also sort of an a acid test for your organization's values. Because I think if you look in most organizations today, a lot of them have developed mission statements for what, what we're here to do. And also, these are the values we operate by. And mm -hmm. so you see a lot of very um, positive, high minded values, like we always put the interests of our, our consumers or customers first and where the safety of our employees are, is our biggest priority or um, we're here to be part of in supporting our communities and help make our communities better places to live and more opportunities for people locally. Well, you're also going to be defined in a crisis by how you will, how well you live up to those values. Yes. So yeah. if, and a lot of, and, and you'll get even more criticized by, by, by the media and others who look at you and say, well, look, you have this value over here that you look out for the, you look out for the safety of your communities first. So why did you allow this situation to develop where you had a failure in the emissions system and you pour and you poured a bunch of effluent into the river, which is also the main water source for the people in that community who are subsistence farmers. So the values are a great place to start. Can we, we, ha we say we have these values as a company. Can we say we're prepared to live up to them in every circumstance? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, you're going all these things that we as communicators get involved in, crap, working to sort of build these sort of documents around corporate culture that sort of provide, provide guidance for people, they get tested in a crisis. And they actually become like a, a, a baseball bat that someone from the outside is going to hit you over the head with and say, hey, you got all these high minded statements, but. How, why weren't they why weren't they applied in this situation? Mm -hmm. The reason I believe you need to do regular crisis drills, and I would like to see organizations do them at least quarterly, 
is to develop the muscle memory to employ the values when the crisis hits so that when a real one does, you don't jerk your knee and revert back to protecting shareholders first. The reason that, and I hate to drag out the Tylenol crisis because it comes up in like every crisis conversation, <laughs> but the reason it stands out is that they did, did put shareholders last when they decided to pull the product nationwide, even though the crisis was only in the Chicago area, uh, because their credo, which was their list of values, uh, put patients first, the people who took their medicines. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's not as rosy as we, we remember it these days. It took several days for them to get there, and it took a lot mm -hmm. of prodding by their PR guy. But they eventually did, and that's why it's remembered as sort of a high watermark for, for crisis communication. <coughs> I think yeah. one of the ways you build that, build that muscle, besides just literal crisis drills, is finding the the small versions of response to a crisis and honoring those and sharing those stories internally. I think people who are internal communicators can play a much bigger role than sometimes they realize in how a company um, is ready to honor its values in, in a crisis. So, you know, we had a situation that one company I was working with and uh, a, there was a, an ins, a, a decision that needed to be made and the customer wanted to do it one way and the internal person said, it's not safe to do it that way. And um, it went all the way up the organization and the employee was backed at every level. And uh, it really, we, we showcased that example and it really inspired employees to know that they can do the right thing and, and they will be backed up by management. So Alice, tell me how do you put that in action as a proactively as opposed to reactively? Well, what we did actually based on, on that incident, you know, we started talking about how do we make heroes of employees who are doing the right things mm -hmm. and share those stories so that other employees mm -hmm. see that as, as the role models. And we actually put together a campaign called uh, Go Beyond, which, which tied into the company's values, uh, the wording in the company's values, and uh, and invited people to send in stories of their colleagues who had done something uh, that reinforced our values. And we gave out awards and things. I and, like it. Yeah, I like yeah it was very effective. I like it. I, I would like to suggest that most crises, failures, and success is down to one thing, leadership. Lack thereof, good or bad. Uh, the organization can be very good, but if the leader, the problem with, with, with crisis leadership is that most leaders who've been in their job for 25, 30 years with lots of experience in business, et cetera, et cetera, and, and professional uh, acumen, think that by default this makes them crisis leaders. Absolutely not. It takes special skills to lead in a crisis. And um, I remember, you know, during the Fukushima disaster a few years ago, we were doing some training with clients. And and on, on this occasion, the CEO said, oh, my God, you know, how could this leader be the, the head of TEPCO, the CEO of TEPCO, the Japanese power company? How could he be so bad at communicating with the press? And I really got annoyed. I said, you try it. A nuclear meltdown and, and a tsunami. You try to take that stress. Can you handle that stress? Yes. Nobody, except if you're in the military, special forces, you do not. This poor man had a stroke six weeks later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people don't realize the stress level and they think that they can manage. And actually, that's where most of the mistakes come from. The organization either ignores or makes bad decision. And it's very often, regrettably, down to ego. Mm. And, and to build on your point, not every leader is a great spokesperson. You, but that's you, a spokesperson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then you can have a leader who's a great communicator, but they are sending out the wrong messages that just exacerbate the situation. And then you have another problem. So you have to bring this leader down off the ledge and say, you know, you're not saying the things you really should and coach him or her. But it gets into your point, Caroline, of ego. 
where they're still thinking, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. You have all kinds of internal issues from that. Well, one of the things you can do is internally in your crisis preparedness, look at uh, maybe delegating out like, okay, if it's this kind of crisis, you're the right spokesperson. If it's this kind of crisis, you're the right spokesperson at, at that top level and sort of divvy it up a little bit so that you protect their egos, but you also get the right person. I, I still remember, and I was I told the story in a presentation recently, when I was at Coca-Cola, when New Coke was introduced, I was in the, the Minute Maid division, so I wasn't directly involved in the fiasco, but what they did is they didn't put the seat EO in front of the uh, uh, press. They put the COO, who was this folksy guy from Omaha, and who got up there and just leaned on the podium and said, "Well, we goofed." <laughs> and the you know the the CEO couldn't have carried it off, um, yeah. but uh, the COO no. did, and it was extremely effective. Well, what is the role of the CEO in a crisis? I mean, somebody once told me, and some of you have probably heard me say this before that CEO should stand for customers, employees, and owners, because that's your audience. And your job is to be the chief storyteller for the organization to bring these people on board, dealing with the big picture, right? Your COO and your president are the ones dealing with the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So if that's the case, what is the role of the CEO in the organization? And then what is the role of the communicator in partnership with the, CC, uh, the CEO in a crisis? So can I object to the premise? Go right ahead. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that the CEO, CEO is always the right person to be talking right. to right. Uh, customers and employees. It depends on the organization. And very few of us have any control over who gets assigned to that role. And uh, so you have to take what you've got and make it work. I, I think that people forget that there are actually two roles. There's what you call a crisis leader, which leads the team and the organization through the crisis, and there's a crisis chair. The crisis chair looks after the business and has their helicopter view, and they work in tandem. And I think a CEO is better as a crisis chair, um, and he shouldn't be the front person to communicate every time, because sometimes you have to defend things that are hard to defend, and there's nobody behind it. So I think... It's that combination, and we often compare it to a, a football team. I mean, you have a team captain. He positions the players on the field. He know, tells them how to play the game, looks at the opposing uh, opponent team, and guides and leads. The team coach looks after the team. And, and I, I just want to and push back. That's... Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. No, I, I'm just going to push back a little on what Alice said about doling out the spokesperson responsibility, that could be dangerous. I I haven't heard that before, and uh, it's not sitting well with me. I think- but, but Sean, if I, if I can interrupt, we, uh, Anthony just said that he agrees with Alice on subject matter expert identification, have the right person on hand to speak to the issue. I, I don't, again, I don't agree. I think it goes back to what you said, Shell, about training. Um, so you can train these people and then you may be able to do that. But in most cases, these teams <laughs> are not trained four times a year. They're trained maybe one time a year and one time a year is not going to develop that muscle memory. And then you give it to the finance person or the HR person and boom. You know, I, I don't necessarily think that works. I, did, I, I, did, I didn't mean of, to uh, hand of, it of, down uh, that far. Sorry, Let's take what? the example of an emissions uh, release from a refinery. I happen to live uh, pretty close to the Chevron refinery in Richmond and have had to uh, seal all the windows and shelter in place more than once in the 29 years I've been living here. Uh, when that happens, do you want to hear from the CEO of the company or do you want to hear from the plant manager? <laughs> uh, who does the press want to hear from? And, and you know, if, if you have a plant manager at a place where that can happen, shouldn't that person be trained? to yeah, address really. those issues totally when they agree. arrive. Yeah. Totally agree. Yep. Yep. And I think there are different levels of communication. And I think that's, it's, it's not one channel. I mean, if, if, if you take the BP, you know, Gulf of Mexico crisis, you know, Tony Hayward basically jumped on a plane, went on the other side to the U S 
to manage a crisis, he did exactly the opposite of what Exxon Valdez did by staying in the office, and he was paranoid. So he took he, he took charge of this. He's an Englishman. He used an English city firm, London city firm, as a PR firm to help them in DC, mistake number two. He should have used his CEO as a communicator in the US and US resources to deal with the situation in the US and then manage and occasionally be rolled out for at critical moments. No, he did it all by himself. And of course, it lasted three months. He made gaff after gaff. So I think there are different levels. I mean, a CEO is not going to respond to every media inquiry, every phone call that comes in. It's physically impossible. So you do have to have different levels of people. And at the plant, I think people do need to get trained to hold the fort and mm -hmm. to communicate immediate information. So I think th th there, there is room for more than one spokesperson, as long as it's consistent and as long as they got backup, because they will be exhausted if they have to do it all the time. Yeah, the mm -hmm. argument that the CEO of Exxon made was that he couldn't manage the crisis from Valdez when he was in his office in New York. Yeah, exactly. He had his whole command center right there, and, and he could be on the phone with everybody and mm -hmm. do a better job. So is is the perception that he creates by being on the site of the crisis also important is that symbolic that it matters that's what i'm saying he could have been in the office but at certain key moments he could have gone to the scene and show how serious he was mm -hmm. and how serious he took this subject and instead he stayed in the office and there's many other examples i mean you know, there's so many CEOs. I don't know if you know about the one from Total and the spill that they had in, Nor in Normandy years ago is, is a classic case of a mistake like you cannot believe. So there was uh, a mag mega spill. I mean, it was pretty big. And in fact, it's the only case of a crisis that ended up in courts in France with a crisis manager being held liable. Um, he, the CEO, is walking the beach just like Tony Hayward after the crisis looking at what the recovery and the cleanup and everything else. And a journalist asks him, sir, how much do you think this cleanup is going to cost? And I kid you not. He says, oh, about one day of my salary. Mm. What do you do with, the with that kind of statement? Mm. It was all over the news, of course. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> so so much or, in base, or, or so insignificant. So, so I think... Training is critical, yeah. Mm -hmm. But also knowing who's good at it and who's not, and you, and if your CEO is not good at it, in the case of Tony Hayward, he was not good at it. It's not the first time. There was Texas City. There were other cases before. He was not a good spokesperson. Mm -hmm. He should have yeah. let Bo, De, Bo, whatever his name was, the CEO, Deadly. Deadly. to to handle it on the ground. So mm -hmm. those, this is yeah. where ego comes in. That's why I think this is where ego comes in. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think that's all the more reason to have done the advance work before a crisis hits of, of establishing your crisis management teams, which yes. could vary depending on what the issue is. Sure, a brief. You want to make sure, um, make, you, make sure, you, make sure you got a spokesperson. You want to make sure you've got subject matter experts with inside and outside who can plug into it and that you know how to get them all together and can convene them on a moment's notice. Yeah, you're gonna have a different spokesperson for a data breach than you are for an, an emission leak, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We have another comment from Anthony who says, as a military communicator, the commanding officer may not always be the mm -hmm. best person. While they have ultimate responsibility, they may not be the subject matter expert, uh, mm -hmm. which raises another issue. Uh, and I believe this was during the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, spill that it was, uh, the instant commander from the Coast Guard who was managing the crisis on the ground, on the shore. And uh, they had a policy that all media inquiries get forwarded to the public information officer uh, responsible for it. And they had people out on the beach cleaning up the oil that was washing up and a camera crew was out there and they put a microphone in the face of one of these folks and said, how's it going? And he said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. You have to go talk to the public information officer. Mm. And that got aired. And, and the commander said, this rule is ridiculous. Uh, you as an employee <laughs> should feel empowered to answer questions where you have subject matter expertise to mm -hmm. answer those questions. How do you feel about that? Should, should employees be free to talk to the media or influence or others if they have 
intimate knowledge and subject matter expertise? That's really interesting, Shell. I, I work for a major corporation where every year we issue media relations guidelines and we told our employees mm -hmm. you had to call the public information or the communications department. They were told you are not to respond. I don't know if that company has changed, but I worked for them for 10 years and for 10 years issued that edict that they are not to talk to the media. So, I think that's pretty typical. I, I think that there needs to be a, a, a there's a better way to handle uh, that face-to-face -face interaction. In it. And I think before you send an employee out onto the scene where you expect media to be, you coach them uh, as to, you know, here's, you know, if, if somebody asks you your, uh, your personal experience and opinion, you can respond to that if they want company perspective, pass them along. Mm -hmm. You know, those okay. kinds of making sure that you don't, you know, anytime you have blanket policies, you have the opportunity to smother something. But that doesn't work all the time, Alice. When you have a situation like Hurricane Katrina, where you have employees in the Southeast and they're being waterlogged and you don't mm -hmm. know where they are, you don't have time to train employees. So the media may reach an employee who's stranded in a building where water is six to 10 feet high. There's no time to train that employee. That, that, in a perfect world, that would work. But in a real crisis world, that does not work. Well, if, you, if, you're, if, you've got a, if you've got somebody who is stranded in a flood, they're no longer an employee. They're a human being. And, you know, and you can't try to control what they're saying. But how do you separate that? You know, they, they I think control. I think if you as a company are deliberately sending somebody into a setting where you know there is likely to be media coverage, as in you, employee, are volunteering to put on your team volunteer T-shirt and go clean up the beach, then you give them those guidelines. Okay, yeah. and that's you have time to prepare for that. Yeah. I totally get that. Totally. Yeah. Get that. I do think that there has got to be an approval, a crisis approval protocol. So a lot of organizations have so many layers for any communication to be approved before it gets released. Well, you should follow, and I'm talking global organizations now, where the center says or the head office says this has got to come back to approval because it's this topic and that category and this. In a crisis, you can't do this. You cannot do this. It's a recipe for disaster. So you have to establish those protocol, train the people, and give them a level of autonomy where they can respond quickly. And we've only talked about media. What about social media? You know, I agree that there should be social media, media and social media guidelines for employees. You can't control it all. You mm -hmm. can't make sure that, but there's got to be some guidelines. There's got to be protocols, and there's got to be teams that know how to intervene quickly if something does go wrong. And it's I interesting. In, in her book, uh, Melissa Agnes talks about the uh, the Ebola outbreak when the doctors from the U.S. started to come back and were quarantined. Mm -hmm. uh, the hospital where they were going to be quarantined knew this was going to create some concerns, so they were ready on uh, social mm -hmm. media to provide. Here's what we're doing to ensure the safety of the community as these people come back. They they, they were proactively providing information that would probably not prevent the concern from bubbling up, but at least tamp it down a bit. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and because social media just came up and because this is so uh, fresh, uh, a, a reputational crisis, let's talk about Miller Knoll. Uh, Miller Knoll is a furniture company uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they opted because of financial situation to not pay bonuses this year mm -hmm. and uh, the bonus eligible employees were unhappy about it so the ceo andrea owen uh had a zoom call with them in which she said uh i have been asked how people are supposed to stay motivated and do their work without getting a bonus this year and then she proceeded to be fairly snippy about it she said you have to leave pity city uh, and just do the job and make the money, uh, all while everybody in the company knew that she had been paid something like a $1.6 million bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, anybody can record what they're seeing on Zoom. Uh, it was shared online. It has gone viral. Now it has had a ton of media coverage. 
this is a self-inflicted wound uh, that was exacerbated mm -hmm. by social media. So as uh, a communicator uh, planning for crises, how do, how, first of all, how do you prevent something like this? And, and second, what do you do once you know the, the cat's out of the bag? Well, it's, it's, you know, I think the one thing we had, the reality we all have to face these days as communicators is that there's no such thing as a confidential document mm -hmm. or confidential information inside a company or something that we can control the whole. There's many ways that that can get out. And the example you have is, is typical in all these situations. Employee comes away from the meeting. Yeah, here, 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 here's the, here's the thing that was passed out. And then, then it's in the wall street journal. So, Given that reality, I think the company and the leadership's got to be centered on these. This, these are our principles of how we do business, how we do things right, and that's. And we're not always going to hit that, but that's going to be our core and our focus. And that's the focus of how we communicate with people. And the other side, if you're worried about information getting out, that's going to be harmful. Well, fix the practices or the problems that are harming the organization, or causing, mm -hmm. causing those, causing those issues. It's not a communication problem. It's a management yeah, that's, problem. That's right. It's a leadership problem. Yeah. We don't have a PR pro problem. Mm -hmm. We have a we have a management problem. Mm, totally. So it's always like when you see somebody refer to something as a PR crisis, like the PR department didn't cause the crisis. It was a gap in performance, yeah. in expectation between what we expect from you as an organization, what you delivered. It was a gap between what you say you stand for and what you seem to really stand for. And that's something that's, I think, an issue for leadership. And that's an opportunity for communicators, too, to get involved I, with leadership. I hear Wilma Matthews whispering to me as you say that, George, because she always hated something being called a PR crisis. Yeah. She made exactly that point. PR was not responsible for this crisis. Absolutely. It ends uh, up by the way, the email she sent to staff after this all became a news item said, I want to be transparent and empathetic. And as I continue to reflect on this instance, I feel terrible that my rallying cry seemed insensitive. What I'd hoped would energize the team to meet a challenge we've met many times before landed in a way that I did not intend. And for that, I am sorry. Uh, and of course, an email to staff is going to be shared externally. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume she knew that. Uh, how does that land with you? She's keeping the money. <laughs> and, and does she really have a choice not yeah. to say that? You know, yeah. I, I, and to George made a great point, but, and you're, you're always going to have rogue employees in an organization. There are always going to be those employees who on social media distribute misinformation and sharing something that may be negative about the company you you can't control it, but if you make it a systemic issue and going back to George's point about the values and the culture and you keep stressing that, it may help, but in the end, you're going to have those rogue employees. I, I, I was going to go back to the point that George made and we have a case of a client where, you know, it really is down to management. Unfortunately, the perception is that the comms team is going to fix it. We have a client in the international cosmetic um, field that uh, um, is headquartered in Europe and has a very large uh, uh, presence in the U.S. retail. And uh, out of the blue, the U.S. team decided they're going to stop multi-level marketing, uh, a new way of selling the products. Mm. With all the bad rap that multi-level marketing has had, the Ponzi scheme, plus the fact that it's actually illegal, Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they came to me and they and the head office came to me, the comms team said, what do we do with this? I said, the only thing you can do is prepare for your comments at head office. And then you tell management in the U.S. that you're not involved and that you decline to handle the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They recluse themselves from the case and they were they made sure that they were covered at head office. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of company, it talks about culture, that a company that leaves a lot of leeway to their operations around the world to do the things that they want to drive revenue. So clearly it's a bad decision and they're kind of independent in their decisions. And then they expect that if something goes wrong, they can go and, and, and knock on the head of his door to go and clean up their act. Mm -hmm. So in this case, no, stay out of it. There is no quick fix for that. There is no fix for that. It's a bad decision. 
no amount of PR is going to make it good. That's right. It uh, reminds me when I worked for a PR firm, uh, the 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 head of the firm had a, a thing that she said which to clients all the time, which is, "Don't do anything today that you don't want to see in the newspaper tomorrow." Mm-hmm. And so now we could, you know, update that to. Don't do anything this moment that you don't want to see on social media three minutes from now. Yes, for mm. sure. Yeah. Okay. I, was, I, I, I wonder what everybody's ta- take is on this case that just happened to Bud Light in the U.S. with the oh. transgender. Okay, so this to me is the ultimate twisting of, of polarization, right? So on the one hand, you had an Adidas case with YZ that makes anti-Semitic comments, and then Adidas is too slow to respond, so they're stuck. Tanks, they're left with so much time. It costs them a fortune. On the other hand, you got a brand, ABI, that is trying to be inclusive by having campaigns across the board of their consumers, including transgender, associates themselves with the transgender, and then some you know, right wing discriminator in in somewhere in the U.S. Uh, who's a rock musician starts to shoot at cans of Bud Light, blaming uh, ABI for actually associating with this transgender um, celebrity. Uh, the, <laughs> right, and so the, the the CEO didn't apologize. He stood by what he did. Yeah, I thought, he, I thought his statement was a little wishy-washy, but yes, he, but he, he, it's, me, it's, but he, stood by, he, he didn't. It. He didn't do a deep jerk reaction. Oh my god! Yeah. So it just, to me, it boggles the mind the type of manipulation and the type of situations that that companies are having to face today. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. It's crazy. Well, I think that in that particular case, uh, and it, it, you can also hearken back to the Nike case when uh, they made Colin Kaepernick a spokesperson, mm-hmm. uh, there was blowback from the other end of the political spectrum. There were YouTube videos and videos on Twitter and Instagram of people burning their Nikes and their barbecues. Uh, and they suffered a decline in revenue and share value for a couple of months. But today, they are several billion dollars above where they were just before they did that. Uh, in the case of, of Bud Light and uh, ABI, uh, they recognized that they were losing sales uh, from their traditional demographic, which is the NASCAR crowd and the NFL crowd yeah. and the like. Those sales were declining and they had to reach a new audience to lift sales. Mm-hmm. And I have no doubt that they expected uh, some blowback and a decline. I think they're in it for the long run. And I would be surprised if a year from now, uh, their revenues weren't exceeding where they were before. Uh, I, I think this isn't a crisis. I think this is something they, he, he was right to stand by their decision. And I think they just ride it out and they'll be fine. Oh, for sure. What What is incredible is the manipulation of, 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 of situations by different types of publics, which obviously exposes polarization to extremes. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, it, and it, re- it requires people who are doing crisis preparedness to think about Absolutely. those kinds of situations and be prepared for them, as I suspect that um, ABI was. I agree. And I'm sure they crunched the numbers on the demographic and what kind of revenue could, they could expect to get from working with that demographic and that influencer and others mm-hmm. that you know haven't provoked the same kind of response. But it's uh, also, I, again, about what, are they living their values you know it's not all about the money part of it is you know what do what does this company stand for does this company stand for human rights inclusion well right now there's like there's so much um political polarization and partisanship in the united states at least on these issues that it's very easy for a big organization that's involved particularly in what we would traditionally call mass consumer products where they're sold to millions of people and you're looking to maximize the audience to get crosswise in these things. Mm. And the best, as I think we've been talking about, the best way to respond is to center it in the values and the strategies of the company. You got to explain, this is why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. It's about expanding the market for our, expanding the market for our product. It's part of a business strategy. Um, And by the way, their, their values, by the way, are dreaming big, strengthen people, create a comprehensive culture and value customers. 
right. right. Mm. I'll drink to that. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's um, there's a lot of other a lot of other issues for those, for those companies too, and they've got to also innovate other products in other areas like the uh, canned cocktails and those kinds of things. That's where that business is going as well. Um, and, and, and it's tough, it's tough again. It's tough with these legacy brands that are out there. If you're trying to transition them from this is what you knew us as and what the consumer for the brand was to something else to make that transition. And part of it's just explaining what that's about. And um, I, go ahead. Be before you get in a jam. And and to build on what George said, as well as you, Shell, I mean, I had this discussion with my students this week about Anheuser-Busch and that whole situation. And their bottom line after discussing it for 20, 25 minutes is, I don't care who they hire as their spokesperson or influencer. That beer is cheap and I'm going to buy it. That is their <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> and, and, and I have uh, somewhat an opposite perspective is I don't care who they have as a spokesperson. That beer is terrible and I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> but when you're a student, it's great beer and it's cheap. <laughs> Shell's a, Shell's a PBR man. <laughs> oh, I've spent too much time in London pubs uh, drinking good uh, beer. <laughs> I know. I have been told that uh, American brewers figured out that by making it ice cold, people won't notice how bad it tastes. There you go. <laughs> you, know, uh, you all are probably familiar with a book, uh, probably have read it, uh, as I have. It's um, probably out of print at this point, but it was called um, Excellence in Communication and Public Relation Management, uh, result of an IABC Foundation study. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a, a quote in that book that has stuck with me for a long time. It, it said that crisis communication is something practiced by organizations that don't engage in issues identification. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was hoping we could spend a little bit of time talking about uh, detecting and preventing crises. Uh, and, and in particular, you know, I mean, I, I remember working with one consultant who had broken crises into five or six categories. There was a meteor mm -hmm. crisis. There's one that just falls out of the sky, mm -hmm. uh, completely unexpected and hits you. But, you know, then, uh, Carolyn, you had mentioned in our discussions before we started recording, uh, the uh, gray rhino type of event. Um, That's right. What, what do you do to detect and, and prevent crises, recognizing that there are some that are just going to fall out of the sky and hit you anyway. I, I, I mean, I think there are some, there's a couple of perspectives to take into account from the, the, the communicator versus the crisis practitioner versus senior leaders. Um, crisis practitioners or custodians in organizations, whether they handle crisis management, risk or business continuity, own the process. Right? They may own it with, hopefully, intervention and collaboration with comms, but they own the process. When you survey these organizations, and they are the respondents, they think that they are very well prepared. Of course, that's their job. Very often, when you survey the rest of the organization or leadership team, you get a quite a different answer. I think because it is not the def going back to the beginning of today's session, which is was the definition, because it's not really well defined. Um, there's a lot of buzzwords that come out during COVID. People talked about the black swan. COVID was never a black swan. Never. There were so many predictions and statistics that showed that we were going to get a big one. OK, mm -hmm. um, so gray rhinos are the ones that you should see coming. And there's a definition from that. Right, the one I, I shared with you in preparation for today. Yeah, you said um, they're highly probable, high impact, yet neglected threats which occur after a series of warnings and visible uh, evidence. Hmm. So, in terms of monitor, this first step I, I think is monitoring, and there I have to say AI can do a lot. Hmm. The ability of AI to monitor, rake, uh, and detect things from what's going on is unmatchable by, by us humans, right? It's what you do with it and how do you train people to be sensitive and to be able to flag the right, the things that need to be flagged to management at senior levels. And also comes down to things like marketing campaigns that went out unchecked 
and are an absolute disaster and cause crises in themselves. So there's not, in my mind, it's not even check and balances and trainings and competencies in organizations to um, anal- to, to deal with this, uh, this amount of data that actually we can get through AI, which we used to not be able to get. So I think on the one hand, it's progressing. On the other hand, there's a big question mark around how, how do you deal with all this data effectively? What kind of men- mindset do you need to build in your organization? Go back to culture. Mm-hmm. What kind of training do you need to you know, put in, in there so that y- your marketing team doesn't come up with a ludicrous, completely thoughtless campaign? You know, To give an example, double crash of Malaysian Airlines in 2014, the marketing campaign at the end of the year comes, comes up with a, a social media campaign that says, what's on your bucket list? I mean, I mean, right? Mm-hmm. H&M puts out a beautiful sweatshirt of a kid, a, 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 on a kid, beautiful. And what's on the sweatshirt? A little black, black child. What's on the sweatshirt? The coolest monkey in the jungle. Mm-hmm. It ransacks off, it, you know, South Africa went up and uh, everywhere. Mm-hmm. These things should not happen. So on the one hand, there's an improved ability to detect and, and, and break all that information, but then you have to have people to, to be able to deal with it. There, there's an excellent episode of the Freakonomics radio podcast with a consultant who helps organizations figure out what went wrong with a, a, a project or a campaign that they are about to launch. Uh, projecting six months in the future, it was a failure, what went wrong? And suddenly they think of things that they hadn't thought of in preparing for the launch of the new stores in Asia or this marketing campaign or what have you. Uh, it's something most organizations don't do. Is no, That's right. There's not enough check and balances. And I think younger communicators, and I don't know if you've experienced that, don't necessarily have the critical thinking. They're not taught mm. critical thinking enough. Yeah. Yeah. So it brings in a whole dimension. Sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say it's another whole dimension. I asked, I'm asked to train young communicators in crisis communication. Yeah. It's they're they're social marketeers. They're not communicators. Yeah. Mm. But to build on your earlier point, Caroline, I, I think it's also incumbent upon uh, companies and organizations to be good corporate citizens, that you are doing good and engaging in the communities before a crisis. Mm-hmm. And, and I can think of the company like Dove, where they are positioning different looks of beauty. They're being inclusive. They have cancer fighting campaigns for women. They're putting money out there. If that company had a major crisis, I think the public would be sympathetic to them as they try to resolve it. But you've got to do all of that work up front before it gets to a crisis. You're building goodwill in the bank, right? Right. Yeah, Yeah. that's what I was thinking. Exactly. And Uh, you still have to, when the crisis happens, you've got that goodwill. Uh, George, we only have about a minute left, but I, I did want to get to one question that, that you had uh, suggested, and, and it ties in with this idea that I believe that symbols matter in a crisis. In, in, in many crises, there is an image that just cements itself in the minds of the public, dead birds soaked in oil mm-hmm. in Valdez, for an example, or a Toyota smashed against a wall during their sudden acceleration crisis. Uh, how do you deal with that type of thing is it important to try to change the conversation or to address even misinformation or disinformation during a crisis and how do you do it absolutely i think i think the organization's got to be the first there with the most information if you don't if you don't have it say we'll get we'll get it to you because otherwise you just there's a vacuum is going to be filled by everybody else yep and if you've been on the other side of these situations which i think all of us on this call have been, uh, when you're on the other end of that fire hose of inquiries coming in, uh, it's a lot for even the most experienced person to deal with. When you've got like 20 different reporters banging on your door and the commu- a community group up in arms, you know, picketing the building and everything else going on to manage your way through that. So the key, again, coming back to what we talked earlier is preparation, mm-hmm. having, 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 the, having the training, the experience and the right people together to respond in those situations. 
I think because, that because for most organizations, they, they'll, they've never experienced something like that until it happens to them. Uh, I think one thing that, that what you uh, mentioned, Shell, brings up is the idea of the visual images. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you need to, as part of your communications, find the visual images that represent the solutions that you're seeking and the, and the, the heroics of your employees so that you can use those images instead of, I mean, there's something for the media to counterbalance mm -hmm. what other images they have. Right, and we're out of time, I'm afraid. We're actually a couple of seconds over time. I do want to let everyone know that our next Circle of Fellows is scheduled for noon Eastern time on Thursday, May 18th on employee well-being and the role of communications, uh, which I'm looking forward to because we've been dealing with that. Uh, the panel includes Jane Mitchell, Leti Narvez, uh, Angela Sinicus, and Stacy Wilson. Oh, wow. uh, great panel of yeah. internal communication experts to talk about that. I hope you'll join us then. Uh, to this panel, Carolyn, John, Alice, George, thank you so much. It was a great conversation. I wish we had another hour to get to the rest of the questions <laughs> that, that I have on my screen. Uh, maybe we'll do it again. This was fun. Right. Thank care, you everybody. so much. Take care, everybody. Bye, nice everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.